Subject matter this morning is actually a very important subject, and I, I think it's something that's lacking in many churches in general. And what we find here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there's a, one of the topics that's covered is this, the notion of basically church discipline and who should be allowed in church and who should not be allowed in church. As a, as a society, as a culture here in the United States, We've got this culture, and probably globally, I don't know how, I can't speak for other countries, but I know what it's like here. And this mentality of, you know, everybody's welcome all the time. We want everybody coming into this church. This is what the modern Christian culture is like in, in the world today, or in, in United States today. And that is an extremely big problem for churches because what happens is that I want to point out the, the title of my sermon this morning is a little leaven. And if you look at verse number six, the Bible says, your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaven it the whole lump. And the reason why this is so important is because there are people that should not be allowed to congregate in the church because what they are is leaven. What they are is sinful or wicked. And they're, bring, they're going to bring something in that's going to impact and affect the entire church to where basically the entire church can die. It can rot from within to the outside. It, the, the whole thing will just become worthless. And churches are destroyed as a result of this because there is not anybody willing to just stand on God's word and if it offends somebody, it offends somebody and if it, if it makes people uncomfortable, it makes people uncomfortable but it's for the best. It's what's right. It's what needs to be done in order to keep things in order in the church, in order to keep a church serving God, in order to keep a church unspotted from the world. We need to be on the lookout. We need to just just not just on the lookout, we need to be ready to stay steadfast in God's word and say, here are the rules. Okay, now you'll notice in our church, there's not a lot of rules. There's not like, like we don't check people coming in at the door. What are you wearing? What do you, you know? All this other stuff. What have you done this week? You know, I'm not going to be breathing down your neck on, on how you live your life outside of church, but I'll tell you what. There are standards that people need to follow, especially as you become more of a seasoned Christian. Because that's who this, this passage is specifically referring to or talking about. In the passage, it says, um, in verse number 9, he says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. So, he says, previously I wrote unto you, and I said, you know, it's not a good idea for you to be hanging out with people who are just fornicators. And you know what? That is good, that is, that is good advice. And that's something that you all ought to, to pay attention to. That you shouldn't just be hanging out, being friends with people who are just sleeping around. Why? Because it's going to rub off on you. You know, un way too many people these have this, this attitude of, oh, I'm going to be a good influence on this person. I'm going to be a good influence on this person. I'm going to be a good influence. So I'm going to be really good friends with them, and maybe I'm going to rub off on them. You know what? That's not going to happen. It's not. You know what's way, way, way more likely to happen is that they're going to rub off on you. Yeah. They're going to bring you down. It's a lot easier to tear someone down than it is to lift somebody up. I've seen this illustration in church before. And I'm not going to perform it right now, but imagine if I were to be standing on the chair, if I was going to try to lift somebody up to me, to come up on the chair and just I had to lift them up, how much force is going to be required to do that versus the other person to just try to yank me down off the chair? It's way easier. It's a very simple illustration, but it, it proves how easy it is. And obviously we're speaking spiritually, but it's the same thing. It's the same concept. It works the same way. It's, it's very easy to backslide and, and to get into all kinds of sin. And it's a lot harder to be working your way, doing what's right, making the right choices, living the right life, being righteous. That, that is difficult. That's not the easy way. It's a lot easier to just say, oh, forget it all. I'm just going to go have fun. 
I'm just going to go party. And when you're around people that have that type of a mindset, the fornicators, whatever feels good, I'm going to do it. That is going to rub off on you and influence you. This is, this is one of the reasons why I don't subject my family or myself or my children to the Hollywood influences because I don't want to be around those fornicators and those adulterers. And those people who are giving themselves over into, into all kinds of, of manner of sin, we ought to make sure that we're not doing the same thing with our friends. But what he, what he explains here, he says, I wrote unto you an epistle not to come with fornicators. So that, that right alone is good advice. That's not who you should be spending your time with and hanging out with. And I can hear the objections already from people. I'm not saying people in this room, but... Well, Jesus hung out with the, the prostitutes and all this other stuff. You know, we're going to get to that a little bit later in the sermon. So, so, so hold off a minute on that, on, on trying to, to come up against it, because there's a point for that. But Jesus was not just hanging out with and just being buddy-buddy and being friends and palling around and just spending all of his free time with a bunch of fornicators. And about that, that's not what Jesus was doing. We'll get to that in a little bit. And what Jesus said or did is not going to contradict what the Apostle Paul said in the Bible because both were speaking under the direction of the Holy Ghost. Holy men were speaking as the Holy Ghost gave them utterance. Whether it's the Apostle Paul here in 1 Corinthians 5 or whether it's Jesus Christ in the Gospels. But now he goes on to clarify what he's really wants to, to, the point he wants to get across here when it comes to church. He says, Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must you need to go out of the world. He's saying, You know what? It's impossible to just never have any contact with a fornicator. You know, you'd have to just go out of the world if we're just talking about worldly people. But here's the standard that he's setting in verse number 11. He says, but now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. Now, it's really important. Every word is important. And just understanding the concept he's trying to get across here is important. We know that on one level, when a person is born again, that because of that birth, they are a brother or sister in Christ, right? But that's not who this is. This isn't just referring to any, to just every single saved person because when a person gets saved, they need to grow. There's a birth that takes place, yes. But at birth, you haven't grown spiritually. A lot of people don't even still know right from wrong in many areas, just because they got saved. And I've used my wife as an example of this in the past because she was someone who's, who was raised without any Christianity, without any Bible, without any of God's word, truth, to teach her what is right and wrong as far as morals go. So she, she was subject to a very worldly idea of what is right and wrong. It was very relative. So in her upbringing, you know, fornication really wasn't bad at all. Not a big deal. So without the Bible saying, flee fornication, and this is wicked, and something you shouldn't do, she didn't know that that is a sin. So she could be saved, and I'm not saying this happened, I'm just saying like a person like her could be saved and then commit fornication. And it doesn't mean that you just can't Talk to that person and just completely shun them and they're not going to be allowed in church because they did that as a new believer who hasn't even heard the Bible and hasn't even had an opportunity to grow. Does that make sense? I mean, there, there has to be some level of, yeah, people are growing spiritually. And I know we're all growing and nobody is just completely arrived. But when you get to a certain point of maturity, that's when you're known as a brother. Right? We say brother so and so in church or sister so and so in church. As, as people who've kind of, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a title, but in a sense it is. 
where you're known in the church. You've already demonstrated that you're faithful. You already have, have learned and grown to the point to where you're, you're coming to church, right? You're seeing these things. You're called a brother. This is who the Bible is really trying to, to identify here as someone that's called a brother, but he's saying not to keep company with that man if he's a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such a one, no, not to eat. And this is an important, this is an important list. Now, we don't go and just start adding to this list, and we don't go and start subtracting from this list either. This is something that's very clearly defined for us that we need to be looking to to say, well, okay, if there's someone, and, and what people always want to do is just make excuses. Brother, oh yeah, but he's such a good guy, you know. But he's, he's gotten into drinking or whatever. Maybe that's something, you know, I use myself as an example. I know I'm the pastor of the church, but drinking is something that I used to do. I used to be a drunkard. So is it, is it really impossible to think that I might ever go back to, to drink again? It's not impossible. No, if I ever do anything like that again, I'm, not, I'm no longer qualified to pastor the church. But not even just that. If I, if I go back to just, to just my old habits of drinking, I shouldn't even be allowed in church. Not just, oh yeah, you shouldn't be pastor anymore. The right thing to do is for you to say, I'm not even going to keep company with you. You need to get your act together. And until then, you're not welcome here at all. That is the biblical approach to someone who's a brother who's taken in drunkenness. Or a brother who is an idolater. Or a brother who's a fornicator. Or covetous. Hey, covetous is a big one. We need, you know, people who are just always thinking about things that they can't have and always money focused and greedy, you know, or maybe it's not money focused. Maybe it's someone who's always focused on another person, someone else's spouse. So that's really bad. So you're not, you're not allowed. You're not allowed. I'm not even going to go eat. I'm not even going to go eat a meal with you outside of church. And if you're not going to eat a meal with someone outside of church, they're dead sure not going to be welcomed in the church. He says, for what have I to do to do it? Oh, it sounds like you're being real judgmental. Why are you judging? Well, let's read what, what the next verse says in verse 12. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. He's saying, yes, don't you judge? Oh, you're judging. Yeah, we do judge. We should be judging. We should be judging righteous judgment and not allowing this leaven to come in. Let's go back up to the beginning of the chapter because of what prompted all of this to begin with in the churches at Corinth, at this, to this church specifically. What was going on? What was the big deal? What even prompted this epistle to be written to them? Look at verse number one. The Bible says, it is reported commonly. So this is common knowledge. This isn't some secret, right? This is something that everybody knows about. It's reported commonly that there's fornication among you. Everyone knows about it. There's fornication just going on in the church. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. He's saying, and this fornication is, you know, it's so bad that even the heathen, even the unbelieving world would be like, yeah, that's wicked. Yeah, that's bad. He's saying they don't even, you know, practice. This isn't something that the world would think would be acceptable. And you guys are, are, are it's common knowledge. This is just going on. He says, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit have judged already. And I have already judged. There's a great chapter to turn to about judging, right? Yeah. We need to be judging. We need to be judging within the church. We need to be judging someone who's called a brother and not just allowing rampant fornication, especially 
weird stuff going on, like it's going on here, it's just, well, just common knowledge, yeah, so-and-so, yeah, he's, he's moved in with, with his father's wife now, and I would like to just assume the best case scenario that this was his stepmother and his father had died. Okay, that would be the best case scenario in, in this. Anything else is, is getting even more and more weird. But even that, even the best case scenario is really, really wicked. It's really wicked and that's weird in and of itself. To take someone that your, your dad was married to, like that is, that is weird. And the Bible strictly forbids stuff like that. You go back and read the law and read Leviticus. Um, some things we shouldn't even need a law for like that, but that's, apparently this was going on and this just shows this happened, this could happen even in a church. But what, what happens, and, and, he, and he gives the judgment here first. He says, um, he says, I've already judged, verse number four, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit, the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan. He's saying, deliver that guy to the devil for the destruction of the flesh. Say, cast that guy out. Let the devil have him. Let the devil have his way with him. Because when you get into that kind of sin, it's only gonna, gonna get worse. Anyways, I mean, that's just gonna, that, that is... That's just so wicked. He's like, this guy needs his flesh destroyed. This guy needs to go through really bad times and he needs to be cast out of the church. It says that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And, you know, hopefully, you know, something needs to get through to some people. And what needs to happen is a tough love. And when you have a brother, someone who is saved, someone who is born again, they're called a brother and they get involved in some kind of really bad sin. You can't just, just keep enabling them and being friendly to them and everything else. No, at this point, when it's something this bad, you say, no, I'm not even going to, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go out to eat with you. We're not going to spend time together. You need to repent. And that's the ultimate goal. Of course, but sometimes you have to do things that, you know, the, the right thing isn't always easy to do. Similarly with, you know, raising children, the right thing isn't always easy. It's not always easy to spank your child when they need to be disciplined. It's not because it's not always fun. It's not always convenient, but it's necessary and it's important. Well, sometimes the best thing for you to do, maybe it's one of your best friends. Maybe you have a friend in church. But they start getting involved. They start backsliding. They start getting into stuff that's really bad. You know what sometimes the best thing for you to do is? So I don't think I want to spend any more time with you. I love you. I want you to get right with God. But until then, we're, we're not going to spend any more time together. And the reason being is because it's going to rub off on you. You need to take heed to yourself. And they need to understand how serious their sin is. Obviously, this is being flaunted in church. Everybody knows about it. They're, they're, they're not, it's not even a shame. Oftentimes, what will happen in a church is you know, people will commit some, some sin, you know, be a fornicator or a drunkard or something like that, and no one will know about it because they're ashamed of it. And that is the right response. I mean, you ought to be ashamed of it. But when it becomes public knowledge out, or when, you know, when you find out about it, you still, need to, you still need to cut the cord. But at this point, they're not, even, they're not even ashamed of it. And by taking these type of measures, these types of steps, saying, what am I going to eat with you? That demonstrates, no, this is a real serious matter. And hopefully they could wait, you know, the person could just wake up and be like, oh man, what did I do? You know, this actually is really bad. Because what we all, everybody, this is human nature, human sinful nature is to try to justify your own sins. You start backsliding a little bit and in your mind you're justifying why you're doing something that you know you shouldn't be doing. And you're making excuses for it. But what happens with the backslide is that you keep sliding. 
And what happens is that your view of sin becomes more and more accepting and tolerant of it because the more you begin to sin, the more tolerant you are of it because otherwise you'd be a total hypocrite and you don't want to, you know, you know that if you're going to judge someone else, the same judgment's going to apply to you. So you want to think that it's really not that bad. This is another reason why we need to have the standard. The Bible just saying, no, this is really bad. We know we're all sinners. That's why it doesn't list off every single sin under the sun that we just can't eat with it because anyone would be able to eat with anybody ever. We wouldn't be able to, to hang out together, do anything. But these are certain sins where it just says, okay, you know what? This is push it too far. You, you have backslidden way too far. And for your own benefit, we're just going to have to withdraw ourselves from you. But the Bible also teaches that once, you know, if a person repents, if they get right with God, and they profess, no, I, I've repented, I'm done, then you welcome them back. They're welcome back in the church, and you, you treat them just as if nothing ever happened, right? They, 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 you come back with open arms, and they're welcome back in. But the point is they have to repent. They have to get back right with God, at least to this degree. Now, verse number six says, your glory is not good. No, you're not that little leaven. Excuse me, leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven. Now, leaven, I think everyone here is aware of this, but what leaven is, is basically it's like yeast. And, you know, honestly, I learned all this through the Bible. There's a lot of things that aren't done the way that they, that they have always been done when it comes to baking and baking bread and things like that. You go out to the grocery store and you go get Wonder Bread or whatever and it's all sliced up for you and it's all made and you don't have to do anything. And many people here, I know that's how I grew up. I never even had, I never even knew what went into making bread at all because it was always just in a plastic wrap and was there ready to eat. And anytime we wanted bread, you just go out and get it and it's there and it's sliced up for you and you just use it and eat it. That's the society we live in today, but that is not the way that people have lived for Thousands of years, okay? That, that has not always been the way it was. So this concept of what leaven is and, and how it works was much more well known. But basically, in order to make bread, you use a little bit of leaven to get it to rise, to get the dough. You start off with a dough, and it's just this, this clump, and if you're just to bake that dough or whatever, it's just going to be solid. It's not going to be fluffy. It's not going to have the nice properties I used to with bread. It's just, it's just going to sit there and just be a lump. And you have to add some leaven or some yeast to it, which is a bacteria, which, which grows and, and actually builds upon and kind of gets into that whole lump of dough and, and helps to give you the properties of, you know, adding the, and, and I know I'm going to get this wrong because I don't know enough about it, like the air, or the carbon dioxide, whatever, whatever gets in there to, to make it all fluffy and, and to... Um, have the texture that comes out when you do bake it. So you add that leaven, and what happens when you add leaven to something, it, it, it ends up, you don't need very much of it. You could have a small amount with a bigger piece of dough, and that leaven gets into all of the dough. It just, it just impacts that whole piece. So there's not much required to be useful for the whole thing. And what's being illustrated here is that, you know, a little bit of sin such a little bit of known sin, a little bit of tolerated sin and just accepted sin when that's entered into the church because the church is considered holy, right? It's supposed to be pure. And when you add this impurity, when you add this sin, and it's a sin, especially like one of the sins mentioned here, and it's just accepted, it begins to infect the purity of everybody around and think about that. It, it, it makes perfect sense. In this example, there's fornication just tolerated, just accepted, no big deal. And it's brother so-and-so is guilty of this. Okay? What's going to happen is, first of all, we've got children in the church. And this is public knowledge. Oh, you know, I've heard you teach that you're supposed to be married and all this other stuff. And, but they come in together. They go home together. They live just like everyone else does. And that's okay. 
No one's saying anything about it. No one's doing anything about it. It's still brother so-and-so and still speaking all the same. Those actions speak a lot louder than the words when you, when you try to say one thing, but then you've got something completely different going on. It's confusion. And the kids are going to look at that and say, well, what's really going to happen then? What's the big deal? Why can't, you know, if, and then, and then you got the other attitude is this, not just with children, but with anybody. And anyone could have these ideas, but the, the children are so much more impressionable. You could also have this, well, you get involved with some others, say, well, if so-and-so, if no one's throwing a big deal about that, I mean, that's really bad. Well, then no one could say anything about my sin, about my drunkenness, about my whatever, about my drug addiction, because this person's doing something even worse than me. And, and people start to get this attitude, and before you know it, it's like a, a free-for-all full of, of just wickedness, just cre you know, creep into the church. And we need to be able to cut it out, purge it out, so that we can be a new lump as ye are unleavened. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 7. I want to see now the, the, we see the teaching in 1 Corinthians 5. We see what it's talking about and how it's to be handled. And I want to compare this to how the Pharisees look at sinners and what the big difference is. Because when we preach sermons like this or, or you claim to believe this and, you know, and, and, and you know, people want to call you judgmental, what they want to do is call you a Pharisee. Oh, you sound like a Pharisee, you and your rules. And, you know, Jesus wasn't like that. Well, Luke chapter 7, we get a good, a good idea of what the Pharisees actually did think and how they viewed people and how that is totally different than what's being taught here. Luke chapter 7, we're going to start reading in verse number 36. Luke 7, verse 36, the Bible reads, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. This is talking about Jesus. So Jesus goes to a Pharisee's house. Verse number 37, Behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of, of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the anointment, with the ointment. When, now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, the one owed five hundred pence and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. So people are saying, well, yeah, that's what you're doing. You're like the Pharisee. I'd say, you know, because what happened to here is you have a woman who's, who's known to be a sinner in town. Okay, she's a sinner. Prostitute or whatever, she's a sinner. Jesus goes to meet with a Pharisee, and while he's sitting down to meet, she hears that, oh, Jesus is there. So she goes she gets ointment. She goes to anoint his feet, to wash his feet. She's, she's crying. She's upset because of her own condition. But she goes to Jesus' feet, and she's cleaning off his feet with, with her hair and, and is being very humble and meek in going to Jesus and showing her love for him. Right? And the Pharisee looks at that and says, Oh, don't you know that this person is a that she, can't, she shouldn't even be near you? You're going to let her touch your feet? And it's this proud, haughty attitude 
of a sinner who's actually coming to Jesus. This is a different scenario than in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, remember, it started off, it said, you're puffed up. They were proud. They were flaunting their sin. This woman that came in at Jesus' feet was not flaunting her sin and just being all proud in her sin and just, well, I'm just going to keep, I'm just going to be like I'm one of you, like one of you Pharisees just in my sin and think it's not a big deal. She knew her sins were a big deal. So there's a big difference between someone who struggles with sin, who knows it's a big deal, who's humble, who's repentant in their heart, who wants to make things right, and has brought themselves so low that they're at Jesus' feet and they're looking for help from Jesus. That person is acceptable because they're pointed the right direction, because they're going toward, they're trying to get things right. That's different than someone who I already know what's right and I'm going to be lifted up and I'm just going to do what I'm going to do anyways. And I'm, you know what? I'm going to be involved in this stuff and it is what it is. And it's just going to be public, public knowledge. Deal with it. Two different attitudes altogether. So we can see why Jesus doesn't have a problem with this sinner at his feet. It's also why he didn't have a problem going and speaking with harlots or speaking with people who may be less desirable who are sinners. Why? Because they needed him and he's speaking to people who are ready to hear him. Not people who have closed off their ears and just want to go, go do their own thing. It's their direction. Now what is the brother, the brother doing that is sinning grievous sins? They're not weeping at Jesus' feet. But rather what they're doing is treading underfoot the Son of God. And we see that reference in Hebrews 10. Turn if you would to Joshua chapter 7. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29, the Bible says, Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace. Hebrews 10 is talking about someone who's saved, someone who has been sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ, someone who, who has received the forgiveness, but what they're doing is they're willfully sinning and they're tro there's a trodden underfoot the Son of God. It's like they're, they're just walking all over Jesus Christ. They're treating their Savior, their salvation, as if it's just no big deal because they just want to keep on sinning. And willfully sinning, are you still saved? Yes, Jesus paid for it all, but when you're doing that, you are just trampling and running all over Jesus Christ and what he did for you and showing no respect for him at all and for the price that he paid in order for your sins to be forgiven. It's like you're adding iniquity upon what he already did and just making things even worse for Jesus because you just want to go off and sin. It says, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. God judges his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10, those verses I just quoted, is, is, is talking about, you know, someone who is a brother, someone who is a believer, willfully sinning, but guess what? They're not going to go unpunished. Because the Lord chastens every son whom he receives. And they will be disciplined. And it's going to be a really, really, really sore punishment. They're not going to like it. It's not going to be bad. And, and another reason that shows we as a church shouldn't be just tolerating and accepting and loving someone who is going to be worthy of God's extreme chastisement because they're treading underfoot the Son of God. And again, it, 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 all of this is really going to end up boiling down to kind of the heart of the matter, the heart of the person involved. What, what are they doing? You know, are they proud? Are they not thinking it's a big deal? Or are they humble and trying to get right? Huge difference. The, the, the person, let's put it in some, of, in some of today's terms. 
There's all kinds of wickedness that goes on. You should be in Joshua 7. We're almost done. I like bringing social media into it. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm getting my example ready. I don't have this in my notes. I'm just, because there's so much problems going on in, in, in a lot of people's lives. And I think that's happening in a lot of Christians' lives and people who call themselves brothers or sisters in churches. And there's a lot of wickedness and people want to justify their own actions for what they do. And they think it's not that big of a deal. And I'm going to be speaking specifically to a similar sin as what was going on here, something that would have to do with husbands and wives. And you think about a person who gets on social media. They're married. But maybe they create a fake account or some other thing and they they're start creating a whole other life for themselves and start talking to people and looking at things and letting their heart go astray. You know what? That's extreme wickedness. That is extreme wickedness. And when people, if you, if you have a friend or someone that's doing that, when you find out about that, you should have nothing to do with that person. That's wicked as hell. When they start going off and looking up old boyfriends or girlfriends or things like that and start getting in all this sin. And you know what? These people justify themselves because everybody is going to do it. Oh, I'm not doing anything wrong. Oh, I'm not doing anything bad. You're getting to this point to where you're just one step away from, from committing adultery. And it's so easy to do. The reason why I bring it up is because it's so easy to do these things today. There's so much, in a sense, there's so much privacy where you can just build fake accounts. You could do things. You could hide things from your spouse. And you could have these separate passwords and separate devices or separate computers or whatever you're going to do this on and just be really deceptive about this stuff and end up destroying your marriage. Now, I had you turn to Joshua chapter 7. I want you to see the impact that this has, that, that people having these sins, what it, what it has on a church. We have a small church here. I consider... Everyone here today, but pretty much everyone that comes to our church, we don't have very many newer believers. We have, we have a few. We have a few people who are a little bit newer in the faith. But the vast majority of people come, I would consider a brother or sister or whatever. In order for this church to survive and to continue doing the work and to grow and for God's blessing to be upon our church, we can't have grievous sins just under the surface and just festering and having that leaven brought in and just start leavening the whole lump of everybody here. It's going to destroy the church. We have an example in Joshua chapter 7 of Achan. Achan is a man that brought punishment on everybody because of his own sin, his own covetousness. Remember, one of the things in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 of, of people who should not be allowed to even be eaten with is someone who's covetous, a covetous person. Look at verse number 10. We're going to read the story of Achan in Joshua chapter 7. Verse number 10, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and dissembled also and they have put it even among their own stuff. So to bring you up to speed in the context, Joshua falls on his face because he, they just go started into these battles, right? To going into the promised land and they're going to take over the promised land and God's with them and they're fighting these great battles and they just won this great victory and now they're going on to their next battle and what happens is they get defeated. They get turned away. They have to run away scared because God's not with them anymore. So Joshua doesn't know what's going on. And he's just, he falls on his face. He's just, God, like, like, what do you want us to do? I thought you wanted us to go in and fight these battles. And now we're, we're like, we're losing this fight. What's going on? And God's like, get up off your face. Like, you know, the reason why this is happening is because the people are, are, have transgressed. They're, they've sinned. 
They've stolen. They've dissembled. They did what I told them not to do. That's why I'm not with you. And, and he's, you know, the Lord's talking to Joshua just like, of course, this is the reason. It's not because I've changed my mind. It's not because I don't want you going in there. It's because there's sin. That's the reason. That's why I'm no longer with you. Verse number 12, Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof. And the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. Jump down to verse number 19. Look at how serious God is about these. saying, you know what? He's going to be burnt with fire. He's going to be put to death for transgressing in the way that he transgressed. And, look at, and we're going to see the way that he transgressed. What did he do? And they go through and they, and they, and they, you know, they, they, they go through the process of finding out who the guilty party is because he's not like coming forward. And then they find out it's, it's Achan, this man Achan. Verse number 19 says, And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. So this is the sin that he's going to be burnt with fire over. Verse number 20, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment, and 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them, and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. He stole some stuff that was supposed to all be destroyed. God's commandment unto them was not to take any spoil, not to take anything, that when you go in and you destroy this town, that everything just needs to be abolished, destroyed. It's not for you. you know, there's, you'll, you'll get more spoils later, but right now you need to listen to the Lord. And he says, don't take any. He, he, saw, he saw a garment. He saw some clothing, he saw some money, some gold and silver. He wanted them and he took them. That sin, taking, coveting, taking it, hiding it. People today would be like, well, that doesn't sound like that big of a deal. You need to get your head on straight and into God's word more than and understand how God feels about these sins because God obviously thought that this was a really big deal. And the sin of covetousness, people just play off as this, oh, it's not that big of a deal. No, it's a very big deal. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. When you love money, when you're greedy, that's covetousness. You're coveting things that you don't have and you're just going after that, that money, that, that covetousness is wickedness. And it's a, it's a very toxic wickedness that God here said that, hey, they're going to be burnt with fire. And they, and they dealt with them. And then you know what happened after that? After Achan was gone, the covetous man was gone from the midst of them. They went out and won battles again. They continued to do work for the Lord. But he said, until this is dealt with, it's not going to happen. And when there's extreme wickedness in church, you better believe it can impact the whole church, the whole group, not just one person. And if we're going to move forward and actually have God's blessing upon our church, we need to make sure that there's no Achan's. The only way you can do it, you know, if it's a known thing, I'll deal with it. If it's public knowledge, I will deal with it. The problem is, this, you know, sometimes these things aren't always public knowledge. With Achan, it wasn't public knowledge. He went and did this thing secretly. So how do we prevent these things from happening? Well, first of all, you start with yourself, right? Don't be Achan. Don't be the one that, that's bringing in the wickedness into the camp. Okay, don't be that person. But number two, 
Be a friend to people who are your friends. Don't look the other way when you see them start going down a really bad path. Don't just, well, I don't want to say anything because I'm friends with them and then they might not want to talk to me anymore. You don't have the guts and the love for the person to be able to say what needs to be said in order to help prevent something really disastrous like this from happening. When you start to see the warning signs, the early indications of things like this going on, you call it out right away. And if you want to, you know, I'll tell you what, it, it's the right thing to do. If you have a friend you see going down the wrong path, start backsliding. Maybe they stop sewing. Maybe they're getting bitter in their life or getting bitter against their spouse and they don't even really want to go to church anymore. And if you're their friend, you know what you need to do? You need to rebuke them. You need to tell them that they're wrong. Maybe you don't know all of the details, but it's pretty easy to spot this stuff from happening. And I almost get to this to a fault sometimes too because I have a tendency to want to just let people do, you know, do your own thing. I don't want to get involved. But when you're friends with someone, when you're close with someone, you're like, I'm not going to tell you all how to live your life. But if I start to notice things happening, you know what? You might need a rebuke sometime. And, and a good friend will do that for you. Now, the other person, they may not receive it well. We've gone through this personally in, in our lives. I know with my wife, people don't always receive it well. But I'll tell you what, if you ever receive a rebuke from somebody, especially someone in this church, someone that you know is doing their best to serve the Lord, if you ever receive a rebuke, I want you to know right now, just know that that person loves you. They love you enough to be willing to tell you that you're going down the wrong path. It's the same way that you know that you love someone who's headed to hell when you try to warn them and tell them about the destruction that's coming of hell. When you love a friend or a brother or sister in Christ, you need to be able to tell them and warn them of the path that they're on and it's just going to lead to destruction. And hopefully we can catch these these things before they ever become serious enough problems to where God's solution is just, well, they just need to be put to death now. Because that's, that's where it's gotten to. Maybe someone could have seen some, some more signs of Achan being covetous earlier on and, and warned them. And been like, hey man, you know, don't, you know, you need to fear God more. Because this is no joke. And that's, unfortunately, when people start getting into these, especially the willful sins, they don't fear God. And if they're saved, guess what? God's going to bring the fear of God into them. Right. And it happens. You're not doing your friend any favors by ignoring their problems, or worse, when you enable them. When you just look past them and just continue to, to, to be friends with people. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, 5, open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Good friends sometimes will tell you things that might hurt. But if they're looking out for your benefit and wanting you to get on the right path and get right with God, then they are looking out for you. They're doing what they think they need to do for you. And it's what the Bible says that we ought to do too. The Bible says in Leviticus 19 verse 17, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Your brother or sister in Christ, another believer. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Don't, su what does that mean, not to suffer sin upon them? Don't allow them to just get off into sin. And how are you going to not allow your neighbor or your friend or your brother to not go off into sin? You're going to rebuke them with God's word. And say, this is wicked, and you can't do this. And sometimes I think people need to make the stand and say, if you're going to keep doing this and talking about these things, look, you need to get your heart right with God, and if you're not going to get your heart right with God, then I don't want to hang out with you anymore. 
because you're going to bring me down and you're going to bring my family down and you're going to bring our church down and you just need to get right. And sometimes people go, but sometimes they come back. Sometimes they do get right. Sometimes they just need that, that slap in the face, as it were, to, to get their senses straight and, and realize, oh man, I need to rethink how I've gotten to this point and get right with God. If you're on the receiving end of a rebuke, hopefully you'll be humble enough to recognize that a friend actually cared enough to say something. There have been a, there's been moments in my life, especially you know, since I started coming to a good church, I started going to a good church, where I've needed rebuke. And I thank God that I was able to receive that rebuke because, and that the person who was able, who, who was giving me a good rebuke loved me enough to do it and wasn't afraid of how I would respond one way or the other because it's not your job to figure out how someone else is going to respond. It's not our job. When you truly love someone, you're going to tell them the truth. And if it comes in the form of a rebuke, then that's what it needs to be. And, and, you know, th my, my heart was right because, I, you know, when I hear the rebukes, and this is, this is why I know so much about this, because I was guilty of it. I, 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 and, I, and I'm still not perfect, but I know what it's like to just make justifications for your own actions, to just, just try to justify your sins and make excuses for them. And I know what that's like. And you start making exceptions and make tolerances. You need to hear that rebuke. But if your heart's right, if you still really want to serve God, if your heart's right with God, then you'll receive that rebuke and say, you know what, yeah, I was wrong. I need to, I, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to get right. And you can keep moving forward. But I thank God for the friends in my life that have been able to, to point out some errors that, that I needed correcting on. And that I wasn't too puffed up to think, well, who are you to say that I shouldn't be doing this or that, you know. No, weigh it against God's word. Does that mean someone's never going to say something that, that isn't right according to God's word? No, I mean, but, but you could still, if someone says something to you and you know, like, no, that's not what the Bible says, and maybe they don't have righteous judgment, at the very least, you could say, well, this person cares enough about me to try to help me in the way that they think that, you know, is right. It doesn't have to cause some big fight, you know, or, or strife. Between, between brethren. But you should at least be able to listen and receive the rebuke and then compare it to, to God's word. And hopefully your heart's right enough to, to do that. And, you know, in our church, we need, to, we need to love each other enough to do that. And I, and I think there is a lot of that here. So, um, but there's, there's, as a smaller church, we need to look out for any, re, you know, for, for everything to make sure that we're going to be able to continue going and serving God and God's blessings can be upon us. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for um, all the blessings that you have been with us and the, the starting of this church, dear Lord, and helping us to get many souls saved. Lord, I pray that you would please just help us to, um, to do what's right, to be good friends, and to, um, and to guard ourselves, dear Lord, that we could all be able to, to serve you better and to get our own sins out of our life and have a pure heart before you, dear Lord. Pray that you please give us the discernment and the wisdom and not to take things to, to either extreme too much to where we're nitpicking every little thing that a person does. Lord, where we can show grace where you show grace, but also draw the line where you draw the line. God, help us to, to maintain that proper balance and that we wouldn't get this holier-than-thou attitude like the Pharisees had and get so lifted up in ourselves that, that we start looking at people, oh, I can't believe you let that sinner touch you as the, the Pharisee did when, when he spake with Jesus, Lord, but that you would help us to, to have the proper humble attitude, but to be able to draw the line and say, nope, we're not gonna, I'm not even going to eat with you if you're, a brother, if you're called a brother and, and you're guilty of the sins listed in 1 Corinthians 5, dear Lord. Pray that you please help us to maintain that balance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.